Good morning. <clears throat> wow, I finally made it. We. <clears throat> I uh, have come to talk to you about the Sabbath today, and uh, I want you to know that this is a difficult topic. It's a difficult subject. All of the world is against this. And in just a few minutes here, I'm going to try to reverse that trend just a bit if I can. Sabbath is is not per se an ordinance or a law. As a Christian understands Sabbath, or as a Jew, Sabbath is part of creation. When God created the world each day, he made something a little more complicated, something a little better, if you will. And uh, you're very familiar with this, and as he got through those things, he said that they were good. And when he created us, humans, God said, what? Very good. And then God created perhaps the most complicated thing of all in a way. On the seventh day, God created the Sabbath. The scripture says he finished his work, and scholars have always thought what it meant was he made the Sabbath. And it wasn't good, and it wasn't very good. It was holy. The definition of holy is rest. It's the only time that the word holy shows up in the book of Genesis. It's about rest. And Sabbath is the real estate and time that God gave the church to exist on. And there's never been a society on this planet that's come up with the idea of stopping work one day out of seven that didn't get it from either a Jew or a Christian. That's where it comes from. It doesn't come from any other place. And as a child, I grew up in a world where this was just a cultural default. Um, I grew up where it was illegal to sell groceries on Sunday. You couldn't buy groceries, you couldn't buy gasoline, you couldn't buy medicines, nothing. There was only one business open on Sunday that would take your money, okay? <laughs> Only one. And, uh, and that's changed. And the world is speeding up. We have the capability of doing anything at any time of day now. You can go to school at 3 in the morning. You can buy a car at 3 in the morning. You can have a three-minute egg in 30 seconds. That's the kind of world that you're growing up in, okay? And it's a very exciting world, but it's a very busy world, and there's a lot of demands on you. And Sabbath comes from a particular commandment, and we're going to read it together. This is the longest commandment in the Bible. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. The longest of the Ten Commandments. This is longer than all the ones that come behind it put together. By the way, I got to do the governor's prayer breakfast in my state this year, and I thought I should be democratic, and I'm going to do it here. Everybody that thinks the Ten Commandments are a good idea, raise your hand. All right? Opposed. It's unanimous. Everybody thinks the Ten Commandments are a great idea. Everybody who keeps this commandment, raise, no, don't do it. <laughs> There's this big gap between what we say we believe and what we're actually doing now. And um, 
one of the things I'd like us to do, and you are the last generation that can maybe do this, is to keep this commandment for a moment, or part of it, which you can keep it right here, which is to remember the Sabbath, to keep it holy. The real translation of this doesn't translate it, remember to keep the Sabbath. It says, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. As many of you probably know, the Ten Commandments are not grouped randomly. They are grouped by two main sections. Commandments one through three are about God. I'm the Lord your God. You'll have no other gods above me. You are not to make idols of me. You can't conjure me. And to call on my name is, is a precious uh, thing. And so to call on it willy-nilly, uh, to use it in vain, is a sin, actually. And all those commandments are about how we're supposed to understand and treat God, are they not? I call them the God commandments, all right? You guys get to t take care of the God commandments over on this side, all right? You guys over here, not so lucky, okay? You're going to take care of the people commandments. Commandments 5 through 10 are about people. They are um, honor your parents, don't kill, lie, cheat, steal, run around, put stuff on your credit card, keep up with your neighbor. I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> says, thou shall not put stuff on your credit card. Okay, so <laughs> those commandments are about God, are they not? So you're going to be in charge of them over here. The longest commandment in the Bible, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. To which group does it belong? God, man, heaven, earth. Which group? You're right. I knew this was Wheaton College. You got it just like that. Both, yes. <laughs> It belongs to both. It is the only commandment in Scripture that God specifically applies to God. Okay? We know that God keeps this commandment. And we're asked uh, to take, it, take part in it. And I like to think of it as a bridge between heaven and earth, between God and man. And when we walk out onto this bridge... We meet God. Now, let's talk about the memories that you had on Sunday. How many of you went to church on Sunday? Raise your hand. That's good. It's to be expected here. Now, there's a lot of stuff that happens in church you sort of take for granted if you grew up that way. I became a Christian 12 years ago. I read a Bible for the first time. My wife grew up as a Jew. My kids were little pagans. We didn't know <laughs> Yeah, we didn't know about this, okay? So you've had a lot of stuff that you just take for granted. We were good pagans, too, I'm telling you. Um, and when you go to church, you, you sing, correct? What other day of the week do humans get together to sing on this planet? So you, you have corporate prayer. You read scripture together. Um, and so then how many of you remember that, um, that you took a nap on that day? I heard that from a number of people. Yeah. Okay. How many of you were made to take a nap on that day? Yes. We've got honest people here. The hands are going up. Um, how many of you remember that it was a day that your family didn't engage in shopping? You didn't go to the mall. Okay. None of those memories are random. You went to church, I'm the Lord your God, you'll have no other gods before you, that's what came uh, first. Um, don't take my name in vain. The commandment when it says don't do something, it's really, that's like the end, you got to the worst point you could get to if you break a commandment. The intent of the commandment is to back as far away from that as you can. What's the opposite of taking the Lord's name in vain? To worship the Lord to call on the Lord in reverence and in joy. Um, commandments 5 through 10, honor your parents. How many of you had meals with your family? Many people remember this is the one day my family was together. Thou shalt not kill. Physically impossible to do while you're taking a nap. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Why do you think your parents made you take the nap?
Okay? <laughs> hey, it's in the Bible. Okay? Uh, now shall not covet. You weren't shopping. The point being that by keeping the Sabbath, by honoring it, all the other Ten Commandments start falling into place. And you're involved in an experiment. And that is experiment is the church has decided that maybe we don't need Sabbath anymore. Maybe we can just do without it. And I don't know how it's going to go. You know, um, it's going away. Who has an interest in taking away God, singing, prayers, family, naps, all that stuff? Who has an interest in blowing this bridge? Satan. Satan does. When you think about Sabbath, you're thinking about big stuff, and it's a big fight. D.L. Moody said, if the church loses, if, uh, if we lose the Sabbath, we'll lose the church. We lose the church, we'll lose the family, lose the family. We will lose a cohesive nation. I'll leave it to you to decide whether he was a prophet or not. Um, I, it, to, for me to re reverse all of culture in a couple of minutes, very, very difficult. It's got to be the Holy Spirit that does this. Um, I know, though, that when I go and I speak and when people start speaking on this, when I started this three years ago, there was not one full-time human being in the United States whose job it was to defend the Sabbath, not one. There wasn't a part-time. There are tens of thousands of people whose job it is on Monday morning to figure out how to get you to do anything on Sunday but go to church. And they have budgets that are enormous. Um, and now we have at least, you know, half a dozen full-time people and about 30 part-time working on it. And so this is kind of a near and dear thing to me. Uh, but I'm a physician. By the way, the number one question I get asked is, do you still practice medicine? I don't. But I miss it so much. And if during the rest of the talk anybody wants to drop dead, you will make me so happy. <laughs> Because I was an ER doctor, and I love that stuff, okay? Um, <laughs> but medicine has this theology, which is first, do no harm. And so I'm going to tell you the only downside and harmful thing that can and has come out of Sabbath. It's the only thing I know of. And that is legalism. Do you know what legalism is? Legalism is when you understand the rule, but you don't understand the reason behind the rule. And as adults, we can make uh, abstract uh, decisions, that sort of thing. Put up the next slide, please, which is my daughter about a year ago, and she's getting married, obviously. It's not Halloween. She's not playing dress up. And, and, and you know, many of you are going to make this decision. It's very abstract to get married, for better or for worse. You ain't seen better, and you ain't seen worse. You don't know, you know? And you're, you're getting into this, and I've been married for 35 years, and, I, and, and it's this wonderful thing you might be getting into, but it's an abstract decision. Concrete thinking, legalistic thinking, is illustrated by the next slide. Okay, when you're this age, that's the same girl at age two, yeah, my daughter has to be the brunt of this thing. Um, when you're two, you don't understand the rules. And I'm going to use her to illustrate uh, what legalism is. And then I'll go to Jesus about legalism. Now, when she was two, her whole world was perfect, except for sometimes her four-year-old brother would push her buttons. Anybody got an older brother like that? He knew where all her buttons were. He personally installed them. Okay, and, and so <clears throat> one day he came running across the kitchen floor and he was yelling, Dad, Dad, stop him and she's trying to bite and hit me, stop her. And he ran out the door and he was gone. And along she comes running and her fists are clenched and her teeth are bared and everything and she's running across the kitchen floor and I'm saying, Emma, stop, stop, stop. I mean it, stop. Nothing. So I scooped her up off the floor, and she was still running like a little cartoon character. <laughs> and I said, Emma, what are you doing trying to bite and hit your brother? And, and she stopped, and she gave me the look of the unjustly accused. <laughs> and she said, I am not trying to bite and hit Clark. I am just trying to bite him. <laughs> That's legalism. 
And when I read through the Bible the first thing, I couldn't help but notice that Jesus is dealing with a bunch of little kids that are like legalists. And they made Sabbath into a legalistic thing. And they took away from the Sabbath what the intent was. They only got the laws and they didn't get the intent. And I think Christ illustrates the intent by that when he, when he came back to his childhood synagogue in Luke 4 and, and he hasn't been there and they haven't seen him for a while and he is the whiz kid at his bar mitzvah, man. He knocked the socks off him down in Jerusalem and they want to see what the whiz kid turned out to be. And he reads from Isaiah, and it's the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. God has sent me to set the captives free, and the blind are going to see, and the oppressed are going to be, I'm not oppressed anymore. And then he says a curious line. He says, and I'm here to declare the acceptable year of the Lord. Does anybody know what the acceptable year of the Lord is? It's the Jubilee year. It's the mother of all Sabbaths. And he sits down and they want to know what he thinks about this because maybe they weren't keeping the Jubilee year. And he says, today, you've seen the Jubilee year arrive. I'm it. You weren't meant to save this day. Sabbath, I was meant to save you. And I'm Lord over this day. If you want to know more about what Jesus thinks of the Sabbath, look at his healings. Look at his miracles. Jesus does the majority of his miracles on the Sabbath and um, every one of them is a healing. No, no walking across water, no wine, no feeding 5,000. Jesus' intent for the Sabbath is that it heal us. And some of you need to be healed right now. Your lives are spinning out of control and you're just kids. And, and you're gonna go faster and faster and faster. And I don't have a solution to this and you don't have a solution to this, but God does. And that solution is the Sabbath. Um, what time was my drop dead time? Oh, nine. Oh, nine. Do you, anything you want me to tell him? <laughs> Don't you like this guy? <laughs> anything? It's, it's do you keep name. the Sabbath? I do. You do? He does. <laughs> I put him on the spot and he keeps the Sabbath. Um, I, I've kept the Sabbath for 12 years. And, um, and my children started keeping it. it. To us, it was just part of, I read the Bible by myself for the first time. I didn't have any Christians around me. I lived on the coast of Maine. I didn't know a single solitary Christian. I read the Ten Commandments. I didn't know you were supposed to subtract one of them. I thought they were Ten Commandments, Ten Gifts, really, that made civilization civilized. And so we started keeping it. And uh, should I tell them about my kids, how they did? Yeah, 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 that would be a good one. So you're Wheaton students. You want to do well in class, right? You want to get ahead. You want to serve the kingdom. You want to go to the top. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I have kids that are just a little older than you. They started keeping this when they were in high school. They went to college. They kept it in college. My son kept it in medical school. My son has kept the Sabbath through residency. You want to hear how it turned out? You think you can't make it? First in her high school class. My daughter didn't graduate from high school. She took the SATs before she graduated, and she got two questions wrong. She disputes one. <laughs> they both graduated first in their college class. My son graduated first in his medical school class, youngest graduate ever there. And he got the highest board score in the United States. They're good students. <laughs> they got a Jewish mom, okay? They have something almost nobody has. They had one day every single week where they didn't have to work, where they were not defined by what they were doing. They were defined by what they were being. And uh, I suggest that if you think this is impossible, if you think you can't get into the graduate schools you want to, if you think you can't get ahead, that in my experience in the church, and most of you have been Christians longer than me, but the people who really make enormous impacts are the people who are doing that with their batteries full, not with their batteries empty. And the only way I know to get my battery full is to go to the Lord once a week and let the Lord do it. Um, so that's been my experience. Another thing I do on my Sabbath, by the way, on our Sabbath, um, we, we sometimes have to do commerce 
I, I preach a whole lot on Sundays. Sometimes I have to go out to meals, that sort of thing. Uh, on a Sunday, I grab the, I grab the receipt, uh, or anybody who works for us in our ministry, we tip 100%. How many of you have waited tables? Christians, real big tippers coming out of the, uh, church on Sunday? Uh-uh. It seems like drunks on Friday can do the math better than Christians on Sunday. It's just amazing. <laughs> Leave 100%. The point being that Sabbath is about abundance. And, and you are being trained to have a, a worldview of scarcity. And God is a God of abundance. He will give you in six days what you can do on seven. So we don't do commerce unless we have to, and then we try to compensate for it. Um, I, I uh, always take a nap on Sunday if I can. Um, they're young, they don't get that. Okay. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the other thing I do is, uh, as an ER doc, it's a pretty cynical job. You know, you see a lot of bad stuff and everything. And so, as a doctor, you build up this defense system of kind of cynicism. And a number of years ago, I started, I started having miracles happen. And I, and I saw them, and I said, you know, I'm going to start looking for miracles. And I write one down every day. If you look for a miracle every day, and if you expect one to happen, guess what will happen? You'll, you'll find one. And so on my Sabbath, I just look back at what's happened over the last week. I'll tell you one of the coolest miracles I, I had not too long ago. I was coming through the airport in Atlanta. I'd been working all day, and, um, and my car didn't work in the kiosk. And, uh, and so I, um, I had to get in the line, and this guy cut in line in front of me on his cell phone, his frou-frou hair, and all this kind of stuff. I wanted to hit him with a stick. <laughs> and so I'm like, get control of yourself. And I said, God, I need help. I don't love this guy. As a matter of fact, I'd like to hit him with a stick. Please help me here, because I want to hit him with a stick. And this little guy goes like this. Have you tried your card over in the machine? He works for the online. I said, yeah, I've already tried. It doesn't work. Let me try it. Oh, great. Now I'm going to lose my place in line. We go over, and he gets in. And he says, you know, there's a, your flight's in like two hours. There's one in 30 minutes I could probably get you on if you, if you wanted to try. And I'm like, yeah. He said, would you mind first class? <laughs> he gets me on it. I'm leaving. I turn around. Has anybody ever seen the movie, Oh, God? I turn around. It's, it's like, oh, God, out of the movie back there. And he's waving like this. The point is, start looking for the miracles. Write them down. And you might have some of these happen. I've often wondered, why didn't people realize what Jesus was doing? They were too busy to see what was happening. So um, go and take books for free if... There aren't enough. You can get them on Amazon. If you don't have the money, you write to our organization. I am so easy to Google stalk. You just put my name into the Google thing, and you'll get to us and write and say, I want a book, and we'll get one. Um, you're going to, we're going to, we're going to, do I have time for one scripture? No, I'm out of time. We're out of time. I'm going to pray, or you're going to pray? Okay, let me pray. <laughs> they can't stop me once I start praying. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, thank you uh, just for me, for the, this, this unbelievable gift of being here today, of, of being able to talk to this group that you have anointed and blessed as you have this institution on so many times uh, to help build your kingdom. Uh, if it could be done anywhere, I think that this place could become a place that honors the Sabbath and keeps it holy. Uh, and I pray that uh, you, you work on individuals here, but perhaps you work on this as a part of the body of Christ um, to heal it and to bring it rest. And I ask for this blessing of peace from your son, the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. Amen.